Here are some tips for using a photo as a source of a landscape painting or street scene, but looking at the photo and changing parts of it to suit a different composition. In this video, I'll cover the full painting process and how you get from this photograph to this end painting. Hello, I'm Tim Wilmot, a watercolour painter and I produce full-length video tutorials with commentary which will help you improve your watercolour techniques and create some great looking paintings. So this is the subject of my painting. This is the town of Ronda in southern Spain, a very popular tourist uh, destination. It's got, it's got this lovely gorge and from one side you can see these buildings on the far side, just above the gorge. So I thought that would make, this would make a nice uh, um, topic for this, this, this subject and uh, allow me to, to really go through my, my sort of thought process about how I come up with a painting idea from, from a, a holiday photograph. So when I look at a scene, I think, well, what can I change? What will be the focal point? What can I add? Looking at the colours, what, what colours could I change? What, what colours are they? Um, of course, with watercolour, looking at the values, how dark are these areas? How light are the areas? And the, the contrast between the two. I may be, um, I might do a, a thumbnail sketch just to get a little rough idea of what the painting is going to look like. Now, as I go through this video, if you want to keep seeing my reference photo as I've got here, as I paint my demo, then open up another tab in your browser, go to this same video uh, on that new tab and pause it on the opening minutes where I show this picture on full screen. Or better still, uh, and excuse the plug, you can join my Patreon scheme, which is patreon.com slash Tim Wilmot, T-I-M-W-I-L-M-O-T, where I share um, these and other high, resolu Im high resolution images and my paintings for painting projects. So let's start painting. The paper I'm using for this painting is Saunders Waterford. It's cold press, which is the medium texture uh, so not too rough not too smooth this is 300 grams in weight and I'm using a 3b pencil to get in the outline just in my mind I've got this composition and putting in the main shape so starting with those background buildings the paper by the way is not stretched it's not uh, pre-wetted I've just taped it down onto some board and it does it does uh, crinkle a little bit when you start painting but as it dries it, it it flattens out again so I don't I don't worry too much about that so continuing along the outline of the building over the right hand side the outline of the trees so just the the main shapes um, across the middle there is the wall overlooking the gorge. Then we've got another layer of buildings on the far side of the gorge. I like the way the, the rooftops of the buildings, they sort of curve around it's not a, a complete um, horizontal line it's quite a nice uh, curve to it from the left hand side and what I aim to do is try and get in as you saw in the in the opening when I showed the the end painting I'm trying to get those uh, bands I've got these horizontal bands going across the, the, the scene with areas of light and areas of dark. And I think that's, that looks quite nice in a painting to, to have those, those areas. They could be 
vertical bands, I've got horizontal bands, light, dark, light, dark, and so on down from top to bottom. So the middle ground figures, not too detailed. I just start off with the head, shoulders, continue down the rest of the figure, maybe not even bother to draw in the legs because, well, with these figures, they're going to be in the middle ground. They're not too close to us. We don't need to be um, too fixated with uh, lots of detail, um, especially with, with the legs. I find if you, well, I personally find if I, if I put too much attention into drawing the legs, the figure ends up being lifeless and uh, your eyes are drawn to the legs and not the figure as a whole. So I, I tend to try and be very brief with the description of the, of the legs. Now there's a car. I'm going to sneak in. I always try and include plenty of figures and cars in any street scene. I think if you if you have uh, a street scene that's devoid of any uh, life, it looks like Armageddon has happened. And uh, yeah, you just you just need something in there to help provide an extra level of interest. Um, it's going to be a bit of extra scale to the painting, trying to look at other objects around it. Now, this is the all important, a couple of figures here in the foreground, which I'm going to use to connect the, well, almost the three key areas or the three main areas of or the only three areas of a painting the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. Uh, I will also be doing this with some uh, lampposts uh, to strategically place those to do the same thing. So another figure here. So a couple of figures in the foreground. I may not have resolved exactly um, any sort of details of these nearby figures, but I'm just getting in the main shapes of them. And now I'm deciding also with the uh, a line going across the foreground, the shadows there. I do put in a little bit of cross hatching just to decide in my mind that those areas are going to be quite dark and areas to the side will be lighter or left unpainted. There's some verticals. We've got to have some strong verticals in the painting that will be lampposts or the details on those buildings. So, ally sketch, just get in those main shapes. So next step is to get in the main wash. Going for a fairly moody sky. Now I don't want to, the, the sky in this composition is a very small slice there across the top. So I don't want to put too much effort into it. It's going to be done very quickly, but I want to create a little bit of a mood with it. So. I've started with just a very weak, dirty wash, anything that was left on my palette from the previous painting. A little bit of a soft cloud, you can see there over towards the right, a bit darker over to the left. The, the sun is coming from the right hand side. So uh, with this mop brush, this is a Raphael mop brush, just very loosely define the sky going over the outline of the buildings. And now, while the sky is still damp, I'm going in with the color, the main colors of the buildings. So 
So another thing I'm changing with the source photo is uh, the, the the direction of the light. I'm going to have the the light more on these buildings and less. They're going to be less in the, in the shade. So in the source photo, the sun was sort of sort of almost coming towards us. Um, so I've changed that slightly just to just to have a, a lot of light on the right hand side and maybe a little bit darker on the left. So painting now the these main buildings a bluish section in the middle slightly yellowish to the right hand side maybe a, a terracotta building here on the left hand side um, so introducing a few different colors to those buildings apologies to the owners of these buildings if they're if they happen to stumble across this video and and uh point out that my house isn't that color or my house has changed position it's this is what we're trying to do here is make a piece of art i'm not trying to copy that photograph exactly um for me that would be quite boring and um, pretty pointless so gradually coming down the painting i've left that building there almost in the middle, that white building, I've left it unpainted. So the paper I've got, it's not the high white, uh, Saunders Waterford do a high white uh, type of paper. This is the sort of, um, I'm not sure what they call it, but more the natural. So it's almost like a light cream in a way. Now, I want to try and keep things still pretty dark on the left hand side so this is the road surface this light the sky um this this is it it won't be touched again um except for maybe a few road markings or tire marks and sometimes as i'm doing here i will, I will almost mix the colors on the paper just to introduce a number of uh, different different uh, colors and hues. Uh, now, now I'm mixing here a fairly common um, mixture that I use and a, a few other artists use. This is ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. I should actually go down my palette on the right hand side there. So from the top, I've got neutral tint. A lot of people ask, you know, what is neutral tint? Well, think of it like a, like a dark gray. It's not black as such. Um, but you add that to another color to really make it a lot a lot darker and it's a quick way of getting in some darker values into your painting so we've got neutral tint then burnt umber burnt sienna um, yellow ochre viridian green cobalt green cerulean blue cobalt blue ultramarine blue alizarin crimson a bright red, light red, cadmium orange, and right down the bottom is cadmium yellow, I think it is, uh, for this video. So what I often do is to speed up the painting process, get out my hairdryer and just a few inches above the surface, just uh, go over the painting and dry this wash because this needs to be completely dry, completely dry before I go on to the next stage, which will be, well, adding in the darker values, uh, shadows and, and things like that. So I started off with that big mop brush and I generally, as the painting progresses, I I'm going down a few sizes in in um, paint brushes. So this is a this is more of a medium um, mop brush now. This is actually uh, what's this? This is a Jackson's. Uh, Jackson's is a 
UK um, paint supplies wholesaler distributor online online store and yeah so this is one of their their mop brushes I'm not sure who the uh, the source manufacturer is I think it's like a um, badge engineer job but um, so so now I'm just starting from that that there's some hills in the background not too dark but just slipped in that um, a little impression of some hills in the background uh, in the that the, we can see in the gap between the buildings the the, the main focal point of the buildings and then um, you, you'd have seen from the source photo there's, there's a whole load of buildings um, municipal buildings or whatever on on the uh, very impressive looking buildings on the left hand side so this is just getting in the darker darker values of these buildings again not too dark they're in the background i don't want to be um too too detailed with these i come a bit cooler as i come down towards the base of these buildings bit of uh ultramarine blue ready to do that and uh on my, on my palette, I've got three, to the right of where the colors are, I've got three um, mixing air, three main mixing areas. And I generally keep the darks in the top mixing area. And then generally in the middle, the cooler um, blues and maybe greens or, or that sort of thing in the middle. And then down um, the bottom third uh, mixing areas, are the, the warms and uh, reds, browns, yellows, that sort of thing. Although I've changed. <laughs> Having said that, I'm just mixing in a bit of warms in, in that middle one um, for, this, for this sort of light red building on the left-hand side. So the top buildings, there is, I'm going to have a couple of them in shade. This is actually quite an old brush, this one. It's, um, it's lost its point. It lost its... Um, with, with mop brushes, you get a, when you buy them, you generally get a very, very nice point. And um, inevitably, as you use them more and more, and if you, well, particularly if you've got um, pans, uh, if you don't use tube paint, use the, the hard uh, pans, then that, that can, you, you can lose the point after, after a few, well, maybe, 20, 30 paintings, you, the, the mid, invariably the middle hairs get lost out of these mop brushes. And uh, so this one has lost it a long time ago, but I don't mind it. So um, sometimes it produces some interesting edges and certainly it could be very useful for uh, foliage, um, doing grass, uh, because you, you, as I say, you do get these these interesting edges. So that's the top left hand building. I'll come across to the second building just before it comes into that lighter bit again. I'm leaving some of the paper unpainted. It just leave some little sparkles here and there i may some paintings i may overdo it a bit and i look at it and i think oh i should have closed closed up those little spots those little gaps so I, i've got to got to be um a 
mindful of that and just uh, keep a check of that as I'm doing it. And um, before the paint, before the paint dries, just go in with a brush and close up some of those little little areas. This is the next. Got we've got the top row of. Uh, houses and then the there's a another row uh, below that so the rooftops for that not too dark a color I will I will add in a bit of detail of the tiles but not too much I'm not gonna be I'm certainly not gonna be painting every single tile but just the impression of those tiles a little bit of shadow underneath the rooftops this always helps to define a roof that shadow particularly if we've we got a sunny day uh, this this is uh, this is um, it's, it, the painting suddenly transforms itself and uh, looks a little bit more realistic and you can now start to see uh, this developing as um, as some the, the the far rooftops there the trees on the right hand side uh, they were actually I think they were quite nicely clipped almost like topiary um, trees I've gone for more of a a rough disheveled outline of a tree uh, and here I'm using neutral tint with a yellow that, in, that gives you quite a nice uh, quite a nice dark green if you haven't got neutral tint Payne's gray would be a good substitute I've used Payne's gray for quite a bit and I tend to alternate between Payne's Grey and Neutral Tint. Half the time I'm using Neutral Tint, half the time Payne's Grey. But it does give you a nice dark green. You don't want to overdo it. It doesn't want to be too black. And it, this, this is with watercolour. Things are going to dry lighter. So you've got to try and think of that and uh, maybe go in a little bit darker than you than you thought so certainly those trees are going to be quite dark at the bases of those trees lighter at the top darker to out, down towards the bottom and now i'm trying to introduce a, a sort of bit of a, a these silhouetted shapes and figures this wall coming in from the right hand side uh, there's there's a really nice I, th I think there's a, a big hotel, quite a posh luxury hotel on the right-hand side, immediately on the right-hand side, which will probably have excellent views of the gorge. But that, I'm just, I'm just imagining here, it's casting a shadow, this large building on the right-hand side, which you, you wouldn't have seen in the source photo, casting a shadow from right to left over the scene, but giving us a nice, a nice silhouette, silhouetted shapes. Uh, against that lighter background of those figures and the wall and different objects on the wall and that's going to connect with these two main foreground figures I've kept the wall fairly warm in colour So sort of a a lighter a lighter brown smaller brush now for the figures I, I could have um kept with that main brush but as I say it lost its point and I maybe it um for doing small little precise figures like this it might have I might have made a mistake so quickly swapped for a smaller brush this is probably one of the uh, smaller brushes I would I would use 
Um, I don't know what the manufacturer's name of this brush is. I've, I've had a long time. It's not an expensive brush. It's a synthetic uh, round brush. And uh, it got quite a, quite a nice edge to it. But and it's quite flexible as well, not too not too stiff. Um, there's a bit of, bit of life in it. And it's quite nice for doing little bits of detail work in the painting. Um, As I say, there's, there's a few little objects and bits and pieces on top of the wall, which uh, I'll include some darker areas here in between those figures. So th those figures, uh, I'll try and make them a little bit lighter compared to the the wall, just a, just a, a shade uh, lighter. I have to excuse, there's a bit of a glare there in the middle and that will obviously disappear when, um, as the paint dries. So coming down with, coming, coming down to the foreground, just to keep things a little bit different, going a lot cooler with the, um, the shadows. So this is a bit of a combination of uh, cobalt blue and ultramarine blue. Drag it from right to left. I've gone back to my medium sized mop brush. And I will, doing a bit of splattering here, so I will go back into areas I've just painted while they're, while they're still. While they're still moist or still damp, go in and add in some extra color, darker color, or as I'm doing here, just a bit of splashing with some clear water with that brush. And then just leave it. The board is on a slight slope, so with, with gravity, it's going to gradually come down the come down the paper and as I say just leave it let it do its own thing and hopefully fingers crossed some interesting textures will will start to develop I'm painting the car on the left hand side just a little bit of a light wash and it's connecting to the background buildings so a bit of a light wash over the body of the car now, now some darker shadows as well that's these horizontals i'm talking about the you can see now it's it's starting to sort of develop these uh, these bands of light so starting from the top the light sky darker rooftops lighter buildings dark dark that dark silhouetted wall going across the middle ground and so on I've gone for picked up my bigger brush again because I've got a bigger area to cover I think this would have been hard going if I'd have stuck with the medium sized brush. So back to my biggest brush, get in this big expanse of shadows in the foreground. Sometimes a big foreground with lots of shadows can be can, can add a lot of drama and atmosphere to a painting. So particularly if, if this was, so this is landscape orientation. If you did this portrait orientation, so we, we make more of a feature of those those maybe those buildings in the background and we we had a, a much bigger foreground so maybe the horizon might be about a third of the way down from the top that would be quite a nice uh, composition as well um, it would be perhaps doing portrait it might be good to with my source photo 
to include the left-hand side of the the bridge, and we can just see the the gorge down below us. That would be uh, another option to go for with with this sort of scene. Back to the small brush, get in these figures. Everything still moist and damp. Perhaps this figure's wearing. I think I might have. Uh, <laughs> I think I might have uh, put in some flared jeans there, on that one. But everything's everything's still in that middle area, and the foreground is all still quite damp and uh, wet. So it's still easy to blend in to to connect these different areas and they, they sort of introduce some soft edges between them or almost become as one um, and a nice bit of red between those figures and the cooler I go really cool on this a little bit darker on this figure so the, the poise the poise of this figure is different from the first one. Up the figure a little bit, a little bit at an angle. Maybe they're having a discussion about something or other. Try and introduce a bit of a a story into the painting. I use my fingertips uh, more and more now to just, well, apart from testing how wet some some areas, but just sort of moving the paint around or just very lightly lifting out a bit of, a bit of paint. So by the end of the painting, I end up with lots of uh, dirty fingertips, which I've got to be careful that I don't um, smudge as I'm doing now. I'm going over... Uh, the, the painting, I need to be very careful with, with my hand and and not um, introducing any dirty marks where I don't want to. I've gone back to the smaller brush, the smaller synthetic brush and and adding in some very simple details to the background buildings. They They are in the background, so I can't put too much detail into them but just a just a hint of a few windows i think and architectural details a darker edge these middle buildings darker edges underneath the rooftops just to define those those roofs a bit more to make them to make them say i'm i'm a roof and uh I'm painting in a very loose way as well, which um, is is a style I, I particularly like. I couldn't, I wouldn't have the patience to look at a scene like this and spend hours uh, drawing it all. I, d I do really admire people that can look at a scene like this and faithfully reproduce it uh, with a lovely drawing and um, a reproduction of it but I I tend to because I lack the patience I want to get things done and go off and do something else so so try and limit my my time that I spend on doing the drawing and doing the painting um, you, you end up painting you're trying to to economize on the, on the time you've got and you you end up with a, a looser style. And these, these windows, they're just marks. They're just uh, very quickly, there's not too much paint on the brush now. And I'm just giving the impression of it. If you think m most paintings, you're gonna be, the viewer is going to be stood back from it, maybe several feet, maybe more. Uh, and when they look at this, when they look at this very quickly, uh, hopefully it should 
give them that that impression of those buildings without seeing with with it without, it's, it's not necessary to see all the details to for it to portray these buildings and the lighting and 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 the brief details so so that that loose style for me is um, quite attractive and suits me a lot but i know it's not everyone's uh thing um oh what i'm, what I'm doing here that left hand figure had a bit of light hitting the head so why not put a little bit of dark something dark behind it could have been another figure could have been a lamppost uh, but in this case i've gone for i've gone for a darker window or doorway or whatever um on those middle ground buildings which i think works work quite well Use the fingertips again. Ooh, going with the thumb as well. I'm running out of fingers. Could also lift out with a brush. So here we are lifting out. So clean brush, maybe damp. The, the brush has got to be damp, but not too wet and then lightly touch the surface. The, the wash is still quite uh, moist and we achieve the effect of lifting off that color and going a little bit lighter in that area and, and a nice soft edge around that as well. Getting ready for my lamp post now. which wasn't drawn in. I've just decided on that sort of third. If I imagine, oh, there's this thing about composition and photographers will understand these, these rule of thirds. So that's sort of almost a third of the way um, in from the right-hand side. Introduce this lamppost. And perhaps I'll sneak in one on the left-hand side as well, just to balance that out. There are a few of these old antique-style lampposts in that scene. Uh, they look really beautiful. Uh, so uh, I must include them just to add a bit of authenticity to to the scene. So I'm just uh, adding in just bits of bits of detail now, not not too much, but in a, in a loose style. Adding in some darker areas just to define some things in more detail for example for example this curve of the road here i think there's a where these fit where the nearby figures are it's the start of a sort of square i believe it's called plaza es, plaza espana something like that um, just before the bridge and the gorge um, in the distance and then the road sort of sweeps around. There's a bit of a curve to it. Anyway, if, if there wasn't one there, I've, I've got it in there. Now, sometimes you, you have a mark on the painting or a little bit of lighter area that, um, that was left, maybe accidentally, and something can be made of it. So... There was that little light uh, patch to the left of the car, and I thought, well, wouldn't that be? Wouldn't that make a little figure over on the left-hand side? Maybe the lights catching 
the top of that person's head. So just go along with that and and add in the body or a jacket and very briefly define the legs as well. Oft, often uh, do that with a painting uh, just to, as I'm getting towards the end of it, look at it and see if there's, see if I could introduce any figures or any sort of street furniture to, um, to, to areas where, you know, it, it where I'd, I'd left, I'd left, um, a little area unpainted. It could be just a bit of the sun catching something. I can just emphasize it a bit more. I'm splattering again with the smaller brush. Now with splattering, with splattering, timing is quite important. So you're splattering onto a, a damp background that you've painted. If you do it too soon, you end up with a, well, you can end up with a, a kind of soft, lighter area, but not the, the sort of um, these darker blossoms or cauliflowers as some, as some people call them. And they're starting to develop then on that foreground. Or if you do it too late, if the, if the wash is dry, then you just, well, just nothing will happen. You just end up with a, a little globule of water on top of the dry, dry um, paint and nothing's going to happen. So it takes a bit of practice. And you can, to larger areas of the painting, the shady side of a building, the shadows going across the road here. It just, it just, it just makes it a little bit more interesting, and and you've you've got these these different textures as well. I've got a bit of light going down the lamp post there, which hopefully works quite well against the darker background of the trees. That might be the shadow of that lamp post I just put in there, um, going and uh, going across and touching those figures. Dark paint now in between, in between those, there's the three figures by the wall, um, just to establish where the, the base of the wall is uh, just to hopefully make it look look a bit more like a wall. A few darks in the tops of the windows to give the impression of a bit of brighter sunlight and darker darker shade in the recess of some of those windows. Underneath the rooftops, now I did say I was going to draw in some of the tiles on the rooftop so ever so gently um, with a dry brush and this with a good edge on the brush I'm just trying to very lightly define these um, tiles not too much if I overdid it just it just draw it it would your eyes would be drawn to those tiles and not to the windows so I gotta be very careful here on on paintings before where I've done lots of roof tiles, it just doesn't look right. Or if I put too much detail into the frame around a window or shutters on a window, it's the same sort of thing. It just, you lose that, that looseness. So, uh, yeah. 
Don't overdo it, basically. By the way, if you do like uh, these videos I'm producing up here on YouTube, please consider joining my little community on the Patreon system. Um, think of it like a, a little art club for like-minded watercolour painters. So at www.patreon.com slash Tim Wilmot, you'll find all the details. Every month or two, well, at the moment at the publication of this video, it's about every month, I set a painting project for for my members and for a small pledge, uh, basically the cost of a cup of coffee, I give you a personal critique. It's normally a short video I send back to you with hopefully some extra hints and tips to help you develop it more. And I, I point out my my own feeling of the, the painting and how you, how you approached it. Um, so hopefully Im improve things for you. But uh, more details, go up to my Patreon site. You'll find the links in the description of this video. And I'd very much welcome uh, any comments as well. Uh, please uh, add in your comments below. Any questions? Certainly uh, click on the like. Give me a like as well. That would be... Uh, very much appreciated. And stick around because I will be doing a, a little bit of a debrief on my painting. as I normally do towards the end of a street scene, is uh, certainly add in a few tire marks with that small brush. And hopefully, hopefully you can see, though, adding in those tire marks on a, on a road uh, sort of leads the eye into the, the scene. And what I also might do is um, get out a little bit of white paint to do a bit of... Uh, highlighting as well. Here is the end painting then. And so that the topic for this video is how to paint from a photograph, how to um, interpret the scene in a different way, how to change things to suit a, a different composition. So let me go back to the, the source photo I just took this right-hand side um, as the theme for the painting. I ignored this cypress tree here, didn't really do much um, for me. It could, that, things like that might be all right on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of a, of a picture or a composition to sort of frame a scene, but it would be in the middle there. I ignored the gorge. Um, I ignored all this left-hand side, the uh, bridge there, and I imagine I was stepping back a good few yards, meters, and and appreciating the scene and, and introducing, allowing me to introduce the middle ground there and the foreground, and using, adding in some figures uh, on my, obviously on, on this photograph I've got no, figures to speak of, uh, but we can see there's some cars coming across the, the bridge. So just sneaked in there, a car on the left-hand side. Um, I want to be careful with cars. If that, if that car was any more over to the left, it would have been verging on not looking right. It would have been too much happening on the, the border of the, uh, the scene. So I'd be very careful not to uh, do that too much. But yeah, so, so having a nice um, middle ground, silhouetted figures, we've got the range of contrasts in the watercolour um, and edges. 
contrasts and edges. So hard edge here. Uh, where have I got a softer edge? Um, well, there's a softer edge there between the building and the background hills. So a mixture of hard edges and softer edges, different dry brush marks here as well that I achieve with that softer brush. So softer brush gives you these nice effects on a rougher paper. If you have too smooth a paper, it just isn't going to work. Smooth, smooth paper would be all right if you're doing very detailed work or some sort of um, maybe a maybe a botanical painting or something like that. Uh, but r rough, rough or, or medium texture, not not cold press. Better, yeah. And range of values. So look at the. So where is the lighter part? It won't show up in the in the photograph here. I've, I've chosen different lighting conditions. But um, this lighter building and that lighter car and uh, the, 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 uh, this figure here, this foreground figure with the light hitting the head and the darker window at the background, um, I think works. So, Catch up with your next video. Look forward to getting your comments.